Hi, everyone. I'm Amit Katwala. I'm an editor and writer at Wired magazine, where we spend a lot of time thinking and reporting on some of the challenges facing humanity. So with that in mind, I'm really delighted to be joined by a man with a frankly ridiculous CV, the United Nations, Google, Meta, SpaceX, and now DeepMind, where he's head of global comms and marketing. This is Dex Hunter Torek. Um, So the headline for this discussion is, will AI help us solve the biggest challenges facing humanity? So a uh, nice easy one to start with, Dex. <laughs> what are the biggest challenges facing humanity, and how will AI help us solve them? I mean, if you look at the news uh, on a daily basis, there's almost infinite challenges, right? Um, you know, I think it can be sometimes overwhelming when we see the scale of problems that communities face uh, around the world. But certainly from the DeepMind perspective, there are a whole set of things where we're starting to see AI already having a big impact. So, you know, you look at things like climate change um, and, you know, the work to try and deliver a sustainable energy future for the world. Um, you know, AI there is deliver delivering the kind of, um, you know, research which might allow us to harness fusion power over the coming decade. Um, curing diseases. You know, we live in a time when uh, we have an aging population around the world. You know, one in five uh, people in Europe is over the age of 65. And we're all thinking much more about our mortality, our longevity, our health. Um, again, AI might have huge applications there. And, um, you know, our technology AlphaFold, you know, has uh, successfully predicted the structure of more than 200 million proteins, which is now going into the kind of work being used by more than a million researchers around the world to do things like accelerate drug discovery and development of um, vaccines and so on. So I think when you look at a lot of these problems, you know, things that are fundamental to our progress as a society, AI potentially has a very, very large impact, and there's a lot to be really excited about. Things like ChatGPT have obviously grabbed the headlines uh, in the last year or so. Maybe people struggle to make a connection between an AI that can generate text or a funny poem or a pretty picture and these kind of world-solving problems that you're talking about. So what are some of the sort of lesser-known ways that AI is transforming industries. You talked about protein folding briefly. Maybe you could expand on that and, and some of the other things DeepMind's working on. Yeah, absolutely. I will say, you know, as somebody who comes from an arts and humanities background, actually, I'm really excited about generative AI. And I think it is important we recognize how potentially transformative those kinds of tools are. Um, I don't want to count that out at all. These are things that we're excited about at, at Google as well. Um, but you're right. It is more than just chatbots. Um, you know, when you're looking at, you know, the trajectory of the next decade, the next couple of decades, you know, I think all of us would be obviously wildly excited if, for example, you know, AI could be part of helping to cure cancer. Um, that would be something which is profound um, for, for all of us. Um, you know, one, one example is just from last week of something that, you know, I think, um, you know, represents the kind of progress that isn't necessarily always going to grab headlines, but is really, really important. Um, we announced this technology from DeepMind called SynthID. And this is a technology we've built which allows us to detect when an image is generated by AI. Now, you think about all of the attention um, and concern that you know, probably lots of us have had over the last decade about things like the rise of misinformation um, online. You know, in a future where you can generate you know, a lot of content using AI um, and it can seem indistinguishable, from content that's being created by people, it's really important that we are able to understand what is the source of uh, a piece of content. So we announced this technology. It's in beta now um, with Google Cloud customers. Um, and basically, it will allow people to understand if that has been generated using the image generation model um, from cloud. And this is, this is just a small step, obviously, towards solving misinformation. I, I don't want to pretend it's a silver bullet for misinformation. But it's something that it will then end up being transformative as part of a larger constellation of solutions that you know, industries and communities um, and others will deploy. You talked about a constellation of solutions there, and I get the sense that there's lots of individual applications of AI, but maybe we're not making that much progress towards this AGI, this artificial general intelligence of, of science fiction, which was one of the kind of founding ideas that DeepMind was, was built on, was to build this? Is that still a goal? Is that something that we're still kind of inching towards? Very, very much so. So, um, you know, for, for those who aren't as familiar with this piece, uh, this is the concept of artificial general intelligence. So uh, almost like a human level intelligence with AI. And this is very much what um, DeepMind was originally founded 
to focus on, and you know, now as Google DeepMind, as a, as a new unit, um, we are continuing to focus on, on advancing uh, technology so that we can get to that. Um, it very much remains the goal. Uh, the kinds of um, you know, breakthrough technologies that we're seeing in AI now very much are continuing to, to lead us to believe that AGI will be a reality and it will be something that um, you know, potentially could emerge over the next decade. Is it something we still want? So DeepMind uh, co-founder Mustafa Suleiman was uh, on the record this week saying that we need a containment strategy for AI. Is, is AGI something that's still desirable in the eyes of the public, do you think? Yeah, I mean, this is an, this is an interesting conversation that comes up regularly, um, you know, and I think will come up increasingly regularly, which is, um, you know, should we be worried about, you know, for example, existential risks coming from AI. And you know, this is something we've actually talked about. You know, a few months ago, um, you know, there were multiple folks uh, at DeepMind who signed a letter from the uh, Center for AI Safety calling on people to take uh, you know, potential you know, long-term risks from uh, AI as seriously as other global um, you know, challenges, so things like you know, pandemics. You know, I think we've got to be very careful about how we approach this topic, though, right? Um, AGI is something which doesn't exist yet, we have a good idea that if we were able to build tools with that level of intelligence, we could do extraordinary things uh, with that. You know, with the current uh, you know, sophistication of AI uh, today, we are already able to do things which are pretty extraordinary, you know, things like AlphaFold, things like advanced infusion uh, research. With that extra capability, that would continue to accelerate and to allow us to do more sophisticated things in that area. Yes, there are potential risks that come in that territory, and these are things we need to take seriously. Um, we don't think it's the most likely scenario, though, or we wouldn't be building this stuff, but we do need to take it seriously, of course. What does that look like? I mean, are you advocating for regulation from governments? Are you advocating for sort of the companies to be a bit more cautious when they're releasing these things? Well, what should that look like, that regulation? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's partly regulation, and, um, you know, I, I previously used to uh, manage uh, communications and public policy at Meta's Oversight Board, which is um, their, their independent body looking at controversial content, which they have a lot of. And, you know, one, one thing that I'm very suspicious of, you know, at this point in my career is the idea that there is one big bang solution to these problems. Like, actually, you need lots of different actors. Like, there, there is no major technological and societal challenge which is going to be solved just by one company operating on its own or one industry. And so we need governments, we need civil society, we need researchers, and we need industry to be looking at these problems and collaborating to try and, and solve them. And I think you will end up with multiple solutions, right? So on AGI risk specifically, you know, there are things that the industry can do. You know, for example, looking at what are the evaluations, the methods by which we can tell um, you know, how an AI is being used and whether it's something that's likely to create harm. Um, but also, we need regulators to be also thinking what are the kinds of guardrails that they should be creating around the industry. Do you think that the oversight board model is a good model? I mean, what did you learn from that experience that, that you, you take into your job at DeepMind? Yeah. I mean, I think the oversight board model, like very specifically how they crafted that institution, is something that made a lot of sense for um, Facebook back when they were still Facebook and, and obviously has created a, a lot of value. I think when it comes to looking at you know, the challenges in AI, that m may or may not make sense you know, in certain contexts, but I think what I take away from the oversight board experiment is that we need to look at the challenges of AI from an international perspective, uh, not just from a Silicon Valley perspective. Um, we need to be very transparent about the kinds of mechanisms that companies are using um, you know, to build uh, you know, our technologies and, you know, to make them safe and responsible. You know, the more transparency that we can share, um, you know, obviously I think the more trust people will have uh, in those systems. And it, it's, really, um, it's really important that we have an inclusive conversation about how to develop these technologies. You know, again, um, it's not just the tech industry that should have a loud voice on the future of these technologies. Um, it's really important that all of us are staying very closely engaged in things that will end up being profoundly consequential uh, for our future. And I think the Oversight Board um, definitely did a good job of engaging civil society, for example, um, and folks from communities around the world. It arguably did a less good job in terms of actual actionable changes <laughs> to the way Meta Facebook operated, though. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll leave that to the Oversight Board <laughs> folks to, to talk about. <laughs> I, I want to talk about 
because you talk about existential threats, right? And I think in, in sci-fi terms, the existential threat of AI is it, you know, seizing control of the nuclear arsenal and killing us all. But actually, there's a sort of smaller but equally important existential threat of AI putting people out of work. And I think a lot of people are looking at things like ChatGPT, Midjourney. There was a story, I think, earlier today or yesterday from uh, a publication that had made all of its Spanish language journalists redundant in favor of machine translations of English articles into Spanish. Uh, so that's AI effectively already <laughs> costing people their jobs. Um, so, you know, what does that future of work look like in this AI landscape, and how do we make sure that AI doesn't actually create an existential threat for people in those kind of industries? Yeah, I don't know enough about that specific example, but I mean, I would say that, because I have this conversation all the time with journalist friends um, and colleagues, like, um, journalists do a heck of a lot more than just the writing. Like, I mean, you know this yeah. better than I do, right? It's a, a, a relationship game. Uh, it requires an enormous amount of, um, you know, research and, you know, pounding the pavement to, to build a story. So, like, actually, AI might be helpful in certain contexts as part of that role, but it definitely actually isn't a substitute for a human journalist in probably the vast majority of contexts. So, this is actually... I think applicable to how I think about the job situation, right? There may be specific roles and functions that AI can do better than humans, and we'll say like this is a thing that um, you know AI might end up taking the lead there. You know, industries and roles change over time, always. I mean, that's just a historical fact. You know, um, in 1900, you know, about 40% of the U.S. economy worked in agriculture, um, and today it's about seven and a half percent, and that was obviously related to the rise of industrialization. I think we should have a lot of faith in what people do, though, and the things that we do well versus machines. Um, you know, when the internet came along and you know, started reaching massive scale you know, over the last couple of decades, lots of people said, oh, the internet's just going to destroy all the jobs. And we know from a couple of decades of economic data that's simply not true. You know, um, the internet created vastly more jobs than it, than it displaced. And of course, it transformed all of our jobs. You know, there's very few you know, industries and roles that haven't been impacted in some way by the arrival of data and information and, and analytics. And I think it will be the same with AI. Um, all of us will be making use of AI in some way as part of our roles over the coming decade and probably much, much sooner for many of us. And um, we should continue to have faith in people. The agriculture is an interesting example because you mentioned that the number of people engaged in agriculture in the US has gone from 40% to 7.5%, but there are still people going hungry in the US, right? And the question I have is, like, how do we make sure that the gains from AI are actually evenly distributed throughout society? We saw with the Industrial Revolution and then with the Internet Revolution that those gains disproportionately flowed to the people at the top. You know, you say AI is going to solve humanity's biggest challenges, but actually it may end up creating even more inequality. Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely don't want to, um, you know, pretend that this is going to lead us to some utopia. Um, you know, again, one of the, the challenges with a lot of the discourse around AI is people trying to think, you know, that there is like a one monolithic future that we might end up in, you know, whether it's a techno utopia or it's doom. And I think we have a pretty good idea from the world today that you can have multiple futures unfolding simultaneously for different parts of the world. We all have supercomputers in our pockets. Doesn't mean that huge parts of the world don't have massive challenges right now. And so, um, you know, absolutely, we're going to face social and economic challenges. We obviously face the, the challenges of climate change. Um, all of these things are going to have to be addressed, and they're obviously not things that the tech industry, again, is going to solve on its own, nor is AI going to solve on its own. It, it, it will require leadership and will from leaders. Um, and, you know, what AI does is it gives us new possibilities, but it doesn't mean that these are things that will definitely come to pass. So, what will this look like if we get it wrong? Well, there's a few different, you know, buckets of risk that we think a lot about at um, Google DeepMind. You know, when things go wrong, I mean, things, you know, I think you can already point to problems we face today in terms of the near term challenges from AI. So you have things like bias and misinformation, deep fakes. These are all things that we need to think about now. Um, you have another set of challenges in the form of bad actors. So, you know, potential misuse of technology that even where it wasn't designed to do something harmful, um, you know, individuals or organizations may try to misappropriate that technology to do something harmful. And then you have that bigger bucket of, you know, the sort of more long-term, more existential risks, as, as, as we talked about. Um, these are all things that we need to address together. Like, it's actually 
you know, again, the thing that I, I get frustrated about in the discourse is the idea that it's an either or. You know, the moment, you know, somebody says, maybe we should take seriously the idea that AI could do terrible things, you know, 20 years from now, people say, yeah, but why aren't you dealing with misinformation right now? And of course, the answer is, we've got to do both of those things. Um, and if not, then we will see things going wrong at much greater scale. Flip side, then, what will, this, what will this look like if we get it right? What's the, I know you don't want to describe a, you know, fantasist utopia, but, you know, what's the kind of achievable, you know, semi-utopia that we can get to if we get everything right? Semi-utopia. <laughs> well, I mean, this is interesting, right? I was a big science fiction uh, fan growing up, still am, and, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about what does some of those more far-flung scenarios for the future look like? And this is not at all saying, like, any of this stuff will come to pass, but if you think about all of the technologies and trends of the future as things that are in interconnected, things get really interesting, right? So thinking about fusion power, fusion power basically would give the world access to clean, unlimited energy, effectively. What could you do with that? What kind of profound impact would that have on the world? Well, there are things that are really obvious, but there are things that are probably less obvious. And one of those examples which I think about is access to clean drinking water. Uh, by 2050, the UN reckons that three quarters of the world's population will be struggling with safe access to clean drinking water. Uh, we've got climate change, we've got uh, conflicts over water, we've got the breakdown of you know, infrastructure you know, around the world. There is a technological solution to part of that problem using a technology that we know has existed for decades and works. It's desalination technology. It's incredibly energy intensive. If you have unlimited energy, that becomes a very different proposition to use that. And what could you do if you had access to that water? Well, you might then be able to address some of those other resource challenges you talked about. You know, By 2100, the world's population is going to be 11 billion people. We don't produce enough food um, for the world even today. And so this is a thing, again, where AI might help us with optimizing those resource productions, and we could live in a very different world with a very different economic model. That's a hopeful note to end on. Thank you so much, Dex. Fantastic. Thank you.